Of so Vaikuntha also have four hands, they're also blue, they also have all the opulences and everything. Uh, but only Krishna has that Srivatsa mark, which is like a little curl of hair on the chest. Uh, special little thing. And then uh, in, well, in Vrindavan, of course, there's only, there's only one Krishna. <laughs> then he can dress up in the very hard. Well, he does sometimes. He disguises himself. There's one really hilarious pastime where Krishna dresses himself up like Abhimanyu, Radha's husband. Huh? And then he comes home. He waits till Abhimanyu goes out. And then he comes into Radha's house. And he's like, you know, acting like Abhimanyu. And then the real Abhimanyu comes home. And uh, Krishna goes, imposter, imposter. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, Ra and Radha's mother is out there with a broom <laughs> chasing him away. <laughs> and everybody's like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is Krishna. <laughs> so, you know, he can, he can disguise himself. Sometimes he'll disguise himself as one of Radha's girlfriends and sneak into her house that way. <laughs> Put on a sari. <laughs> so Krishna can get away with anything, you know. He's <laughs> his uh, yoga maya potency can create any kind of illusion. It's very powerful. Krishna can do even the impossible, like appearing in many places at one time and doing all kinds of different things with different forms. And just there's no limit to what Krishna can do. So could we say that it's, it's basically on Krishna's side to reveal who he is? Well, yeah, because as soon as we see Krishna, this rasa awakens in our heart. See, it's like, you know, we may come in the temple and pay our obeisances because we know that that's what we're supposed to do, you know. But when we actually see Krishna, we spontaneously pay our obeisances because this, this intense rasa awakens and then it's like oh you know it's not we don't even have to think oh I want to pay on my obeisances now we just automatically fall on the ground because it's like such intense emotion yeah so uh, when we see Krishna we'll know it <laughs> uh, more questions You mentioned um, Arjuna having many different forms and Narad Muni having different forms. Mm -hmm. Is it a, a quality or property of some advanced souls or even ordinary jiva souls can have that quality in minute quantity? Or ordinary is it jiva souls can have. If Krishna gives the service, he also gives the facility to do the service. Even if it means the extra intelligence of how to manage several forms simultaneously. I mean, after all, he's managing millions of forms simultaneously. So he could easily give the, the jiva the intelligence to manage multiple forms. Is it any way related with a splitting of con consciousness? No, consciousness is never split. Or, uh, only, in material, only in material consciousness is our consciousness split. Krishna wants me to have some multiple forms or multiple activities, you know, then he can give me enough intelligence where I can do that. I don't have to split my consciousness. My consciousness isn't split between my feet and my hands and my mouth when I'm playing drum and singing and dancing, you know. So, uh, you know, he can also arrange that. So, 
going back to um, the quality of souls uh, being born in Kali Yuga. I can't hear you, Taylor. Going back to the quality of souls being born in Kali Yuga. If these souls do not make enough progress to attain liberation or at least the higher planets, uh, would they continue to incarnate all throughout the other yugas or would they be stuck in Kali Yuga even until... If they, if, even if they attain the higher planets, they'll still be uh, reborn in the material universe. Even during Satya Yuga, let's say? Sure. Okay. Yeah. The clock is going all the time, you know. The yugas are, are coming one after another. And then uh, if the soul does not attain liberation, he's going to be in the material world somewhere. Whether a higher planet, lower planet, this species or that species, until he attains liberation, he's going to be in the samsara. You know, samsara means the round of birth and death. Uh, and we don't know what the next body is going to be. Uh, so unless we become spiritually enlightened, then we attain a, a spiritual body according to our consciousness. But if our consciousness is materially conditioned, then we attain a body according to the, the, the qualities of material nature. So we don't know what the next body is going to be because it's not determined by our wish. It's determined by higher authorities uh, at the time of death. Prabhupada explains it's, it's like, you know, those little green worms out in the garden that move like this. And then they, they'll four legs on the next branch and then their hind legs will move over. So Prabhupada explained it's like that. When, when it's time to change the body, it's like we become aware of the next body before we even leave this one. See? And then, yeah, and then at the time of actually leaving the body, then we change completely to the next body. at the time of the death determines uh, the destination a uh, consciousness at the time of the death determines yeah. the not the uh, thought exactly but yeah, the consciousness. consciousness so how is it that we can see the next body at the time of the death well, it's not exactly that we see it but it's, know about it it's more well it's more or less that we are in that state of consciousness already See, it's the state of consciousness, not the, not the exact thoughts. But what are the, what are the thoughts at the time of death? Uh, it's said that a person's life goes before their eyes uh, in a few seconds at the time of death. And I experienced this when I had my near-death experience, when I had my heart attack. It's like my whole life appeared before me, you know? And it's funny, it was like, it was like this long thing with all these pictures. And I could look at one individual picture, you know, or take out another one and look at it. And they were all arranged in order like that. So uh, the quality of all of those impressions together determines the state of consciousness when we go to... the sum total of those impressions of my life is going to give me a material existence in the next life. But if I spend my whole life performing spiritual activities, then the bulk of the impressions is going to be of spiritual quality, and I get a spiritual body in the next life. It's that simple. So we are creating the next body every minute of every day by the quality of the impressions that we take in. So that's why it is very, very highly recommended that from the beginning of life, we follow this sadhana and spiritual process and spiritual activities. That way, the average value or va average quality of the impressions that we have from this life will be spiritual. You know, This idea of, oh, I'm going to do all my material work, and then when I retire, then I'll cultivate spiritual life and, and go to spiritual world. No, it's not going to work. 
because by that time you've already acquired or accumulated so many material impressions. You see that in the last few years of life you won't be able to counteract all that. Plus, people develop habits. Habits, uh, not only physical habits, but mental and emotional habits. So if you develop a habit of material work, and then at the very end of your life you try to change it, you won't be able to. There's a very instructive story in this regard that once there was a king and he was discussing with his guru exactly this question. He was saying, the, 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 the guru was saying, no, you should perform spiritual activities along with your duties of managing the government and so on like that. And the king was saying, no, I want to concentrate on this material work now and then at the end of life I will do spiritual things and attain salvation. And the guru was saying, no, no, it doesn't work like that, you know. And so he said, I will arrange something to prove this, okay. So 